All right, today we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, starting at verse 16, Galatians 5, verse 16. Last week we started Galatians chapter 5, and we looked at uh, the need to stay free in the freedom that God has given us from sin uh, and from the consequences of sin and how we can stay under grace and keep ourselves under grace and that one of the evidences of abiding in grace and staying under the grace of God is the love that we have for one another. And that gives evidence to the love that we have for God. If we're not loving each other, then we've stopped loving God. It really is that simple. Uh, loving God leads to loving each other. When you see Christians fussing and fighting, somebody has stopped loving God. Somebody else, the other side might be because they're standing up for truth, but somebody has stopped loving God. Just pure and simple. Today, um, we're going to finish off chapter 5 and. And, and i got to be honest with you, it, this is, this is going to be a tough message to preach simply because I love you so much. But normally you're used to me stepping on toes, but as we get to the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit today, I'm probably going to be stomping for some of you. Maybe not, I hope not, but some of you might feel stomped on a little bit today, and I want you to understand my goal is not to stomp on you today. It might be God's goal but it's not my goal. I don't know where you are in life. I don't know where you fall on the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. You know that, God knows that, and when you see yourself, and I hold the mirror up to you this morning, when you see yourself, that's time for you to respond to God, not to me. All right, and so I want to share that with you as I begin today, because what we're going to see today is how we are to walk, whether in the flesh or in the Spirit. A father and son arrived in a small western town and they were looking for an uncle whom the father had never met. He'd actually never met him but for some reason was searching him out and they were walking through the town square and he said to his son, he pointed across, there's my uncle and pointed to a man that was totally walking away from him and couldn't even see his face at all. And the son said, well how in the world could you possibly know that that's your uncle when you've never met him? He said, son, he walks just like my father. That is the work of the Holy Spirit, to cause us to walk like the Father as revealed through Jesus the Son. So today I've got one point with a bunch of lists underneath of it, a couple of lists underneath of it, okay? My one point is this, the true gospel is the path to perfection. It is the path to perfection. Perfection. Now notice my point does not say the gospel makes us perfect in the here and now. We are perfected unto eternal life. You are, if you've accepted Christ your Lord and Savior, because God sees Jesus when he looks at you and sees his perfection and his perfect sacrifice on your behalf, you are by grace saved and going to heaven when you die. But the reality of life is such that we know, every single one of us right now knows that we are still unworthy of that apart from Christ because of how we live, because of what we think sometimes, because of what we say sometimes, how we treat other people sometimes. We know that we're really unworthy of it, and it's definitely by grace. Amen? We are still in need of sanctification, that's the theological word, for our present life. That's the perfection. We, we are not yet complete as to what we will be. The, 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 the scriptures talk about this on both sides. You are completed for eternal life, but yet Paul and others write over and over again that our salvation has not yet been completed, meaning we are not there yet in heaven, and we have not become all that we're going to be, but when we see him, we will be like him. We will become like him instantaneously. We are like him unto salvation, the fact that he lives in us. But we are not living like we're like him. One day we'll do that as well. And that day has yet to come. And so we're not perfect yet. All right? Not completely. But these verses do not deal with the end result of the gospel, which is our pathway to perfection. They deal with our present reality and define the path we need to be on in order to be as perfect as we can be this side of heaven. How are we to walk until we get there? How are we to walk on this journey we call life? 
These verses we're going to look at today set the bar for how we as believers should live in the grace of God. And I'm not going to read them as a whole. I'm going to go along a little at a time today. So let's just start at verse 16. Paul says, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Now that gives us a great secret to the Christian life right here. In fact, it may be one of the most succinct verses to tell us exactly what it takes to overcome sin, and that's to walk in the Spirit. Not through works or personal effort, but the power that the Holy Spirit supplies, which is the reason why God sent us the Holy Spirit at the request of Jesus the Son, the helper that we needed, the paraclete, the one to come alongside us and help us walk rightly because God knew, Jesus knew, that we could not. Which leads to the question, though, and Paul understood this, how do we walk in the Spirit? How do we do that? Well, I can tell you it's not a 12-step program. <laughs> it's not something you go, I'm going to do this, this, that. Walking the Spirit most certainly requires spending time with God's Word, praying, fellowshipping with the believers, serving the Lord. Those are things that keep our hearts and minds focused on Him. But I'm going to tell you, Paul doesn't even get into that here. Instead, what he chooses to do to define what it means to walk in the Spirit, he describes the life lived in the flesh and the life lived in the Spirit so we can examine ourselves and know where we stand. To know if we're on the path to perfection or if we have stepped off and returned to the path that leads to destruction, not that we can lose our salvation and go to destruction, but we can certainly go back to walking that path with all of those who are going that way. Our end result remains the same, but Paul is concerned with the life we live until we get there. You follow what I'm saying this morning? Shake your head and nod. Say, yes, yes, I get what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. If you don't get this, you won't get the rest of it. Okay? It's important here. Verse 17. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Salvation ends one war the war over our eternal life or death, and starts another in the present reality, a war that we were not aware of. Suddenly we become aware of sin in our life, more conscious of it. We become more aware of whether we're walking in righteousness or unrighteousness. This battle begins to, to wage inside of us between what the Spirit of God is telling us and what our flesh is telling us, between what the Spirit wants us to live like and what our flesh wants us to live like. And they're in opposition to one another, Paul says. And the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit. It's Satan's desire that we live according to the flesh so that we quench the Spirit. And don't live according to the Spirit because then we lose our witness. And nobody else gets saved because of us. But then the other side is it, the Spirit is against the flesh. The Spirit is constantly trying to say, that's of the flesh. That's sin. Jesus said he's going to come and convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's what he does. The Holy Spirit does that in our life. And these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Okay, well, that, flip, that works both ways. If you're walking in the flesh, then you cannot do the things that you know please the Spirit no matter how much you want to. It's really hard to do that. If you're walking in the Spirit... It's really hard, if you're really truly walking in the Spirit, to do the things that please your flesh. They're in opposition to one another. Let me define this very carefully. And I'm going to use an illustration here, sort of. Take sexual desire, for instance. Let's just go to the, to the heart of the matter because that's going to come out as we get through this anyway. Within the marriage relationship with spouses... Desire can be a sanctified, acceptable thing. Outside of that relationship, husband and wife, it is always, not sometimes, not in certain situations, it is always a sinful work of the flesh. Same action, but God puts parameters of acceptability on it. You see, God defines what is holy and what is not. His Spirit directs us to what is holy and acceptable, 
and away from what is not. Holiness doesn't mean no fun and no pleasure. In fact, it's the opposite. Staying within the framework of God's character and will allows for pleasure in this world that has joy as the result. You see, sin is the pleasure of the world without the joy of the Lord. It feels good at the time but it doesn't give you any lasting benefit at all. Sin is enjoyable on the outside, but for the believer, should leave us feeling uneasy on the inside. Holiness may still include external pleasure, not saying it doesn't, but doesn't leave us feeling at odds with God. Holiness keeps us at peace with Him. So the same act done by the believer and done by the unbeliever may be different in God's eyes depending on whether we stay within His acceptable parameters or not. Everybody understand what I'm saying there? Okay? I'm just preaching the Word of God today. I hope you understand that. I'm not trying to get into your life. I'm not trying to meddle in your life. I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. None of this changes whether we are acceptable to God through Christ. We are. If you're in Christ today, even if you're walking in sin, you're still acceptable to Him unto salvation. But our actions as believers are either righteous or unrighteous based on whether we live within the parameters of God's Word and will or not. And I'm going to tell you, if you're a believer today, you have the Holy Spirit. You know. I know. We like to go, well, what about this, Lord? What about that? What about, we like to start questioning him and get into minutia. You know, and I know too. We know what's acceptable. We know what is holy because the Holy Spirit in us tells us and reveals that to us and gives us a discomfort when we step out of that. And that's what he gets to in verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Spirit leadership is superior to the law. The law reveals the nature of God and His holiness, tells us how to behave, but yet we can't fulfill it. But the law hasn't been done away completely because the spirit within is the nature of God and His holiness. What I'm telling you today is this. If you're struggling with knowing what is and is not sin, you need to get in touch with God's spirit. Because the spirit within is the holiness and character and nature of God, and only the Holy Spirit can give you that clarity. When I get to these lists here in a minute, the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit, the only way you'll have clarity on that is if you have the Holy Spirit. You might get some clarity. The Holy Spirit can give an unbeliever clarity to bring them, to draw them, yes. But if you're here and you're a believer today, when I'm done preaching this message, you'll know exactly where you stand and how you're walking, if you're honest today, and listen to the Spirit. The law hadn't been done away with. We just have it in us. We have the Holy Spirit in us to help us with the specifics, of, to know how we are walking, and whether we're walking in God's grace or whether we're walking in sin. So let's get to it. Let's get to verses 19 through 21 and the deeds of the flesh. Let's read that together. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I'm going to start sounding like an old time preacher today. Okay? the hell's fire and brimstone type preacher today a little bit. All right, we're going to get to it. If we're walking in the flesh, these things will be evident, maybe not the whole, but certainly some. Paul is very, very broad here. I mean, he, he gets, I mean, he has a long list here that, that, that you can't help but being in if you're walking in the flesh somewhere. You may not do all of these things, but some of these things are going to be evident in the life of a person who's walking in the flesh. Let's talk about what they are. Immorality. Let's go back to our illustration a few moments ago. This is specifically based on the Greek language. The word is porneia, meaning sexual immorality. We get pornography from that. Those in the spirit do not 
question what this means. We know what sexual immorality is. We may not always stay within the parameters of acceptability according to God's holiness, but we know when we have stepped out. We know when we have strayed away from being moral in this area. We know it in most cases, and at times we, we, we don't seem to. I personally think it's more of an unwillingness to accept the truth rather than an ignorance of the truth. Those walking in the flesh may be saved and have the Spirit, but refuse to listen to Him. That's an issue we have. Jesus said lusting after someone is the same as adultery. That definition alone could put us right on the edge of immorality and put us into it if we fail to walk in the Spirit for even one hour. Sexual immorality is a real thing even within the church today. And we have to understand in order to walk in sexual immorality, we have to quench the Spirit. The Spirit won't let us do it. Will not. Will fight and war against that decision every single time. The second thing he says here is impurity. Now this, is, this means unclean. This is broader than morality and refers to anything internal or external that defiles us so we can't approach God. If you're in Christ today, this one's covered. You are always clean and able to come before the Father because of the Son. You can boldly become, come before the throne of grace, not works. Now, we can be unclean in some action or thought, absolutely. But Christ has made us eternally clean. Here's where it hits us, though. The believer should want to be clean. The work of the Holy Spirit in us gives us a desire to want to be clean before God, which means that comes through confession and repentance, and, and we have to be honest about who we are. And, and that immorality I just talked about a few moments ago, if that's a part of your life, then you have to recognize that that's causing you to be unclean. Even though you're going to heaven when you die, you should not want to stay in that condition before God right now in, this, in, in the here and now. We should want to get that right the Holy Spirit is saying, make that right. Walk rightly, not wrongly. For the unbeliever, impurity is what keeps them from ever being able to be close to God until they accept Jesus Christ. Until you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are unclean because of sin. Not because of what you do, but because of who you are. We're born sinners, and we're unclean until we accept Christ. Third thing on the list is sensuality. That's, again, mainly sexual excess here, unrestrained indulgence of the flesh. Let me talk about the marriage relationship for a minute. This one's possible even within the marriage relationship. Marriage relationship should be two people agreeing as to what is and is not acceptable between the two of them and God. If something's uncomfortable for one member of the relationship, then it's not for that relationship and should be forsaken. Um, you can indulge in sensuality when you should not. You can make sensuality the point of it all rather than love for one another. And so we have to be careful with those things, and I hope you understand what I'm saying there. Sensuality basically is indulgence without shame and without any concern for what God has said about it or for what anybody in your life says about it. Fourth, idolatry. That's worshiping any other God, anything other than God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I'm not going to go into that deeply. We've been doing that in Sunday school. We do that on Wednesday nights. We've been talking about idolatry now for years. Uh, it's one of the themes of my, uh, my ministry here is to help us understand that we allow things to creep into our lives that supplant God and keep us from spending time with Him. And every time we do that, we make that an idol. We cannot let anything come between us and God. Otherwise, it's an idol. Fifth is sorcery. Sorcery. This is witchcraft, psychic, seers, etc. Hold your place and go to Deuteronomy 18 for a moment. This is where it comes from. Deuteronomy 18, and some of you I know have got a question that's going to be burning by the time I'm done with this, and yes, I will address it. Some of you are wondering what that is. I'll leave you hanging for a moment. Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12. 
I realize this is Old Testament, but it still holds true because Paul brings it up in the New Testament. Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12, all the way back near the beginning of your Bible. says this, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire. That means they were engaging in child sacrifice. One who uses divination, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these detestable things, the Lord your God will drive them out before you. Now, I don't think too many of you know people like that. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Don't know that any of you have met a sorcerer or a witch lately. Uh, I know when I was in seminary in Wake Forest, North Carolina, there was a coven there. And uh, we got together every so often in the dormitory, and we were praying against that because they were after the high school kids down the street and trying to pull them in. This is talking about something that happened very prominently back then that would confuse God's people. They would go looking for a word somewhere, and they were willing to accept it wherever they could find it, especially if it was one that was favorable rather than not so favorable to them. I'm giving you a word today, and you could dismiss it, saying that's not favorable to how I'm living my life. Or you could accept it and say, I'm not living my life right. That's a favorable word. God, you're right, and I'm going to submit. Here, they have all these witches. They have these sorcerers, spellcasters, medium, people calling up the dead and things like that going on. And it's still going on today. So what are we talking about back here in the New Testament, back here in Galatians? And you can go back. What are we actually talking about? Well, we're talking about don't go to them. Don't consult them. That's demonic. Can the devil tell you something that's going to happen and it turn out to happen? Yeah, because he can turn around and sometimes make it happen. Don't go there. All you need to know to know what you need to know for today. You don't need to know tomorrow. Bible's clear about that. All you need to know is right here and right here, the Holy Spirit. He's the only one that's omnipotent. He's the only one that's omnipresent. He's the only one that's omniscient, knows everything, is God. Anytime you seek a psychic, anytime you seek a witch or a seer of some sort, you're seeking demonic presences that can only offer you something far less than what God can offer you. And most of the time when people are seeking that, they're trying to get answers to things they really don't need to have answers to anyway. Just live life. Now, some of you are going, okay. Does this include Harry Potter? You were thinking at some of you, weren't you? Huh? Okay, whatever. What is being forbidden here is the consulting of those things. You will not find in the scriptures anywhere that says, have nothing to do with it in a television show or movie. But now let me ask you a question. Why do we find things that are clearly promoting the demonic entertaining? Just saying. Why do we find it entertaining? Isn't there a lot of other things we could watch? There's plenty of things out there. And there are a lot of things we could do. Maybe we don't need to be watching much of anything anyway these days. <laughs> I think there are plenty of other ways to entertain ourselves without supporting something that glorifies the things of Satan. That's my point. Am I telling you it's sinful to watch it? I'm not. I'm telling you it's a waste of your time. That's what I'm telling you. And it doesn't do your spirit any good, no matter what the moral end result might be. That's my opinion. I can't say, thus saith the Lord, on that. But I'm just calling, calling that out as principle based on what I know of the things of the Lord. All right, let's move on. Number six is enmities. This is hatefulness. 
person given over quickly to anger and self-defense, the kind of person I've heard this even from believers over the years, and I've even thought it at times, you know, if they ever try that on me, I'm going to, okay, I hit some of you there. That was a stomp. I know I got that one. I knew that was going to be on target. That's enmity. That's a hateful spirit. When we're already planning what we're going to do to somebody if they do something to us. Something they may never do to us, but we've already allowed ourselves to have in our mind a hatefulness toward them before they've ever even done anything to us. And you know who that hurts? It doesn't hurt them. It hurts our spirit. It, it puts us in a place where we don't need to be spiritually, mentally, emotionally. We just don't need to go there. We need to refuse that. Enmity then leads to the next thing, strife, which is bitterness and divisiveness. These are relational problems. Then we see jealousy is the next thing. That's resentment that flows out of covetousness, often seen in our actions or heard in our words. That's when we look at somebody or something and say that or they should be mine. They should be mine. Then comes outbursts of anger. Now, some of you just picked your feet up off the floor on this one because you don't want me to step on you too hard here, but this is expressed hostility without self-control. What we would call flying off the handle. Being short-fused. We have to watch that. You know why we have to watch that? Because it often happens when we're around unbelievers. That's when it happens. It happens to me that way. The days I have a short fuse at work, I'm around somebody that I'm trying to be a testimony to, and in that moment, I undo weeks worth of work. Just in a moment. Because I had a short fuse that day. Praise God, I don't have a short fuse every day. But there's some days that it's shorter than others. And we have to watch that. We have to know, we have to recognize when we're kind of mentally and emotionally getting in that position, and we got to step back. we just got to step back before we really let ourselves get too far. The tenth thing is disputes and dissensions. That's arguments that lead people to take sides and form factions. This happens in churches when people are walking in the flesh. We've talked about that already. Then envying, that's similar to jealousy, but not necessarily expressed outwardly. Envy may start out putting someone on a pedestal, for instance, but ends up with the desire to take their place on that pedestal and to be that person. Then we get to the twelfth one, drunkenness. All right. Doesn't say drinking. Nowhere in the scriptures is drinking actually forbidden. You've heard me preach that before. I've never hidden that. But it warns that there's a fine line. and You better know where it's at. Let me ask you this, does drinking inhibit the senses? Absolutely it does. Drinking inhibits the senses. So if drinking impairs our ability to drive a car, then it also impairs our ability to focus on and worship God. Let's just get it down to where, to the nitty gritty here, right? And are we always supposed to be worshiping God and focused on God all the time? Yes, that's what makes drunkenness a sin. It's not the alcohol. It's the fact that it keeps us from fulfilling our calling to honor and worship God. It gets our focus off of him. We lose our faculties in that moment in time, and we lose touch with him. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Don't lose focus on God for anything at all. Listen, if you want to relax and unwind or put the day behind you, God can sure help you a lot better with that than alcohol can anyway. I can tell you that. A little time in the Word, a little time in prayer. If you're married today, maybe a little time just hugging on and praying with your wife or your husband and just spending a few moments with them will settle everything out from that day. It'll melt away in the love relationship you have with God and each other. It'll be gone in a moment, I can assure you. Just do it. Take that direction with it rather than a bottle. 
and you'll be better off. Thirteen is carousing. That's partying, probably included drunkenness, sexual immorality. I don't need to define that. I think you know what it is. He goes on to say in verse 21, of which I forewarn you, which is what I'm doing today. That's the minister's calling to tell people that these things, if lived out constantly, probably mean a person is unsaved. If there's not spiritual fruit that reveals God's grace at work, then the person is lost. Christians might do these things occasionally, but should not allow themselves the freedom to do them at all or do any of them all the time. If this is something that's true of us all the time, we need to deal with things with God. We need to get serious about it because we cannot be the witness God wants us to be if any of those things are true of us all the time. We need to repent and follow and accept God's grace. On the flip side, Paul turns to proof that a person is saved and walking in the Spirit. Yeah, I'm going to run a little long day. Don't worry about the time because this is the good part right here. You're going to see where you're at for sure here. Uh, these are things the law cannot accomplish, nor can we on our own. He says in verse uh, 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So we got love. That's agape, the higher form of love that comes from God a love that we return to God because He has filled us with it and it allows us to show Him to others through our good works, it's an active love. We respond to God's love not just by saying, I love you, but by loving people around us with His love. God's not into lip service. The Scriptures are clear about that. God is into action. Worship me, tell others about me, and that tells me you love me. More than anything. You could tell anybody in this room, I love you, I love you, I love you, but if you're never willing to be there for them when they need you, you don't really love them. If you're not ready to serve them when they need somebody to serve them, you don't really love them. We gotta, we gotta love each other with an agape kind of love, a selfless, godly love. That's a, that's a fruit of the Spirit. Another part of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. The joy of the Lord that only the believer can possess. We talked about this not too long ago. A joy that we as believers can sacrifice if we abide in sin rather than the Savior. Joy has nothing to do with circumstances in life. Joy is a condition of the heart. It's God's heart in us that gives us joy, a joy that others should see on our countenance. Joy. Third, he shares here is peace. And here's where we need to stop for just a moment. This is peace of mind in knowing Christ and securing eternal life. Again, this is tied to salvation, not circumstances. This is lasting, forever peace. Peace that we have no matter what's going on in the world. No matter what we're watching on the news and how we feel about it, we still got peace. We're not sitting there fretting and afraid. We're not worried that everything's going to fall apart around us because we know nothing's going to fall apart for us. God's already got us. We got peace no matter what. Do you have that today? You know if you do or don't. Do you have a deep, abiding peace that you know comes out of the relationship you have with Christ? If the peace you think you have in your life goes away when things start going bad, that's not the peace I'm talking about. That's a peace based on circumstances. And that doesn't guarantee that you have eternal life. You might. But the peace that we have is steady and sure, and the only reason we lose it is when God's bringing conviction on us and saying, hey, you're saved, but you're, you're walking where you should be walking. Come back. And he lets us feel a little bit of lack of it but yet still in your mind, in your heart, you know that you know that you know that you're saved. That's the peace I'm talking about. It, it does surpass all understanding. I don't understand it, but I got it, and I praise God for it. Sometimes it's the only thing that helps me keep my head above water in this world and have a certainty of God. When things are really going bad, it's that peace I come back to. God, but I've got peace. I got peace. You know, I talked about last week about that document that was here and you know, refuting Paul and everything. And, and you and I, we went to lunch, and one of the things I shared with, with Debbie and Robbie was I said, you know, he's, he's refuting the, the, the scriptures that Paul wrote, which means you take out almost all of the New Testament. <laughs> and, and I said, I settled that long ago. 
I'm at peace with God's word because I'm at peace with God. I, I got a deep abiding peace and a certainty about it because I'm walking with him. All right, let me move it on. Next thing is patience. <laughs> I heard a groan. I think I know where it came from. <laughs> this is the ability to endure through hardships brought on primarily by others. This is not the inability to wait in line at an amusement park or to sit at a red light for my daughter back there. It's not that at all. This is when things are coming against you, people are coming against you, you endure it without losing your cool. It's the ability to accept those hardships as temporary things of this world while waiting for the relief and reward to come. It's being patient with life, knowing that life, your life is eternal and that one day things are going to be different. That's the patience we're talking about here. Jesus patiently endured the cross. Hebrews tells us that knowing the resurrection would occur on the third day. We impatiently endure this world because we know one day where we will be. Amen? That's the patience that's really being spoken of here, a patience that comes through the Spirit. Then it says kindness, that's having concern for others. Too many people today only concern for themselves, maybe their closest family and friends. Kindness is the mark of a tender heart for God and for God's creation, including all people. A lot of these, if you go back and forth, you go back and forth with this this afternoon, you'll see that a lot of the fruit of the Spirit actually counteracts some of those deeds of the flesh, okay, directly. Goodness is the next one. That means morally and spiritually. There's none good but God, so this is a clear manifestation of His presence in the believer. This is more than being a good person. This is being a godly person, a godly person. Faithfulness, this is loyalty to God and God's people, the kind of loyalty that he shows us, the kind of loyalty that says, yes, I'm going to spend time with God, the kind of loyalty that says, yes, I'm going to spend time with God's people. That's faithfulness, faithfulness. The next one is gentleness, which is meekness. This is a person who has a gracious spirit essentially toward God, a person who accepts the calling of God and the leading of God without resistance. Gentleness or meekness means submissiveness. I submit to God. I submit to, to accountability from God's people if necessary. I submit. When God speaks, I submit to what he has to say. And then the ninth one, and this might get some more omis, is self-control. This is in regards to passions and desires primarily. Uh, a lack of this can get us into all kinds of trouble with any one of the deeds of the flesh. This is the last, I call this the catch-all in Paul's list. He gets to the end, lists all the things, say, you know what, I'm not going to keep lists of self-control. Just control yourselves, everybody. You know, just keep yourself under the things of the Lord. Self-control yourself by spending time in the Word, by spending time in prayer. Don't fly off the handle at people and said, step back and go, Lord, help me. Give me what I need. Give me the patience I need. Give me the help I need to, to not react in a way that will dishonor you. Self-control. Something I think that we can do and too often like to make excuses not to. I mean, after all, it does feel good to set somebody straight in our flesh. But what does that do for their eternity? He says here in the last part of it, in the last part of verse 23, against such things there is no law. <laughs> you know what that means, right? No one makes a law to keep people from doing these things. No one makes a law to keep you from loving somebody. Nobody does makes a law to keep you from having joy. Nobody makes a law to keep you from having peace. Nobody's made a law to keep you from practicing self-control. There's no law against that because they're good things. They're great things. Verse 24. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The form of self-control needed to walk in the Spirit is a drastic murdering of one's fleshly appetites. And I use that word on purpose. It's the conscious killing of anything that is not 
of the Spirit. This is serious. And it's New Testament stuff. It's serious. God takes sin seriously. And even if we're saved, it doesn't mean we should just rely on grace and do whatever we want. He's saying, kill that junk. One thing at a time, put it on the cross and crucify it. So that it doesn't have to be a part of who you are. And re- let me replace it with all these wonderful things I just shared with you. Continual sin is deliberate resistance to God's spirit. Instead, we should be killing it and continually walking with Him. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. We must be merciless when it comes to destroying the deeds of the flesh in our lives and cultivate our relationship with the Spirit in order to have victory over the flesh. If we don't walk by the Spirit, then we will carry out the deeds of the flesh and ruin our witness for God. And listen, don't feel guilty. I'm not telling you to feel guilty today. What I'm saying is, if this is an issue for you, if any of this is an issue for you, change. It's your choice. God has given us the free will to walk in Him or to walk in the flesh. Be determined to change. Give the problem to God and say, replace it with yourself, Lord, and give me something new. I want to be a new creation. The goal is to walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. That's the goal of the Christian life. Brought down to its simplest terms. The goal of how we live between now and the time we die or the time we're taken out of here is to walk in the Spirit. And what did he say back in verse 16? And you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. You're sitting there thinking, I found myself in the deeds of the flesh today. How am I supposed to deal with that? Walk in the Spirit. How do I do that? Self-control. Personal choice. Walk with God, walk with God's people. The more you do that, the more you walk in the Spirit. The more Spirit-minded we become, the more time we spend in God's Word. The more time we spend in prayer, the more Spirit-minded we come. The more Spirit-minded we come, the less of the deeds of the flesh will be evident in our life. It's that simple. It really is. We like to complicate it and say, but I can't, I can't, I can't. Well, you got to. You got to. Or you can't ever be fully what God wants you to be in this world and be the witness God wants us to be. Verse 26. He adds, adds a little something there. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. You know why he adds that right there? It's a warning to not judge one another on these things. And I'm not here to judge you today. I'm here to let you judge yourself. I don't have that place in your life. All I can do is preach a word. All right? You listen to what God has to say, and you decide, am I, am, I, am I standing rightly or am I standing wrongly? Am I walking rightly or am I walking wrongly? How, how am I doing, God? But we're not here to point fingers at one another. We're here to encourage one another to walk in the Spirit. And that's what I'm doing today. Can we be perfect this side of heaven? Not in the practical sense of not sinning. Jesus has rescued us from the penalty of our sin. God shows us grace because of the mediating work of Christ on our behalf, but we will sin until we draw our last breath. The goal of the believer is not to do better. It is to abide in the one who wants to reveal his nature to us and through us, to abide in him. If if you approach this, listen, if you approach this, all right, I'm going to do better, I'm going to do better. No, you won't. You're setting yourself up for failure. Instead, identify the problem, take it to the Lord, and say, Lord, I want to walk in you, and then just start walking in Him. Walking in the Lord is not something God does for you. It's something you and I choose to do with Him. We have to put time to it, effort into it, and have a willingness to listen and obey. But we have to abide in Him. Got to walk in the Spirit, and then we won't carry out the desires of the flesh. So often the Holy Spirit speaks to us, to us, we hear and know exactly what He wants, and we choose to quench His voice and do what we want. The Christian life comes down to whose voice are you listening to, the one of the flesh or the one of the Spirit. And the only way to have clarity is being in His Word, prayer, and with His people because it sharpens our senses spiritually. So, let me close with this. If you aren't hearing the voice of the Spirit at all, you don't know that you're hearing the voice of the Spirit, you don't think you're hearing the voice of the Spirit at all, let me give you three things that might, and one of these is probably true for you. You may be lost and do not have the Spirit dwelling in you. And that may be why you're not hearing the Spirit. 
That's the worst case scenario because you're still under condemnation and need of grace. And the Spirit is graciously speaking to you right now, just in this moment, to try to get you to accept Jesus Christ so that He can then come to dwell in you so that He can then make you who God wants you to be, who you were created to be. You have to decide, do I want to be that person? Do I want to be in Christ? Do I want to not just secure heaven when I die, but to be a person who is acceptable unto God who made me? And the only way is through Jesus Christ. Or you may be saved, but you spend little time in God's Word. The Holy Spirit, we're told, brings to remembrance that which we have learned. Well, if we're not in the Word of God, then the Holy Spirit can't convict us using Scripture so that He can get us back where we're supposed to be. You might have accepted Jesus Christ and walked with Him for a while, but now you're not walking with Him at all, not spending any time in God's Word apart from maybe hearing a sermon here and there. And you're wondering, well, why can't I stay on this path with God? Why am I in those deeds of the flesh so deeply? Well, it's because God's Word is not in you to where the Holy Spirit can bring it up and say, my Word says, you know, flee from youthful lusts, this, that, and the other, whatever the Holy Spirit needs to say to you. We're third, you're saved, you may spend time in the Word, but we all have that one or two sins in our life that we just stubbornly hold on to, that we don't want to let go of. We kind of like to keep a little piece of something for ourselves, you know? And so we purposefully quench the Spirit in those areas of our life over and over and over again. And you know what that is in your life. I don't have to tell you. The Spirit is continually telling you, this is a stronghold in your life. I want to tear down. Will you let me tear it down? God's asking you, will you let me tear this sin down and remove it from your life? Will you give it to me? And practice self-control. And only you have that decision to make. You've got to make that decision. He's not going to make it for you. He's not going to force it on you. He'll let you keep going on in that sin for a while. A long while, perhaps, until you're willing to finally give it up. So three responses today. If you don't hear God's voice and have no shame or guilt over sin until right now in this moment, your response is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If all the guilt you've ever felt has just been right now in this moment, you say, I've suddenly awakened and I've suddenly realized I'm apart from God and I've never walked in God. I don't know what you're talking about, but I see myself in those deeds of the flesh. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He died on the cross and rose again that you might have everlasting life. He wants to forgive you and he can cleanse you and he does it not because of anything you'll do, but because of what he has done for you. Maybe you're saved, but you're feeling helpless in your sin, get into God's Word. Start reading. Start spending time daily with the Lord, and you will see over time a transformation take place in your life where the deeds of the flesh will become less and the fruit of the Spirit will become more. The more time you spend with God, the more like Him you'll become. Or third, maybe you're saved and you're already doing that, but you got that one sin or two. Not only confess it, but get help. This is where I believe the confess your sins one to another comes into play. When you have a stronghold in your life that you just haven't been able to beat, you haven't been able to let go of, find somebody you trust that you know loves you and will keep it in confidence. Share it with them and pray together. Get somebody that can help you get out of whatever it is you're in and can't find your own way out of. Do it. Do it now. Run to that person. Do not let Satan keep you from them. If you know who that person is, run to that person and say, I need help. And if you're that person that they come to, help them and love them enough to keep it between the two of you. Don't tell a soul, not even your spouse. Nobody else needs to know, but you help that person. And you walk with them until they're out of their pit. That's what love is, and that's what love does. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word today, and it's been a deep one today, a very difficult one today. And God, I thank you that you preached it to me first. And that you preached it today through me, secondly. 
And God, I pray that there's somebody here right now that needs to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, that by your Spirit, you're revealing that to them so clearly that there's no denial, there's no stopping it, that they will give their heart away completely to you right now. Just confessing they're a sinner and inviting Jesus to come into their heart and change them. If there is someone here that's trapped in a sin, they feel like they're in this deep pit and it's over and over and over again and they can't seem to help themselves, help them to find the help they need, to go to the help they need, to get the help they need from you and from somebody that can walk with them. But Lord, help us to be honest in this moment, to submit ourselves to you, to see clearly where we are and to respond as you want us to respond today, no longer quenching the Spirit. Lord, make yourself known to us now, we pray in this moment of invitation. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.